In the 21st century, cities around the world have started to reinvent themselves through smart city initiatives. Challenged by growing populations and the increasing difficulty of meeting the needs of citizens, cities are counting on technology to provide solutions. The center of attention, data, our data. Smart cities are collecting and sharing large amounts of it. Big data offers insights that can help to optimize city operations, manage resources and improve the everyday life of citizens. So, how's our data gathered? Who needs it? What for exactly? And is our data safe? Smart cities use a lot of sensors and connected devices to analyze data. All around the globe, urban areas are trying to become smarter and more connected. For those of you who get goosebumps thinking of completely transparent cities of the future, big data is far from being futuristic. I, I think it's, it's really the lifeblood of cities today and uh, will be um, you know, the bricks and mortar that we use to construct cities in the future. This is Dr. Anthony Townsend. He's an expert on urban tech innovation. Cities without data, for him, unthinkable. We orchestrate our, our, our lives and our communities and our societies with algorithms. Um, and those algorithms operate on data that is sensed uh, through, through digital technologies. Anthony sees a city as an organism with a nervous system that collects signals to constantly learn and respond. The continuous addition of new technologies is immensely important for this. It means that our cities will be able to, to change more over time. They'll be able to fit better with our needs. Um, they'll be able to mesh better with the natural environment and um, they'll be uh, more comfortable to live in and more pleasant. But we're stuck in this weird period right now where we're doing all kinds of things with data that um, make people uncomfortable and we haven't really yet discovered or drawn the limits of how we collect data uh, and how we use it. And so that's, that's why things are so unsettling right now. That is exactly the point. Many of the technologies that surround us every day are a mystery to us, like black boxes. We often have no real insight into what is happening with our own data. I want to find out how exactly is our data being collected and what technologies are behind it. I'm meeting with Tom van Aman in Amsterdam. We're at the Marine Terrain, an innovation campus in the center of the Dutch capital, where companies can plan and even test the city of tomorrow. Tom works in the smart cities domain himself and tells me, it's one thing to design and develop technologies in a lab, but a whole other story to apply them in real life. That's another reason why he appreciates the Marine Terrain. So it's not just hypothetically talking about the impacts of these technologies, it's really grading, designing and building and testing uh, physically uh, on location so that the public has um, an opportunity to give us feedback about what their opinions are, what they think uh, these technologies means for them and, and how these technologies can improve their cities. But the Marine Terrain is not only used by companies. In summer, the area is full of people that are swimming or sunbathing here. But what if an area is too crowded? When does it get dangerous? It's not only in times of the corona pandemic that overcrowded places are a problem. Just think about a mass panic or a potential terror threat. That's where Tom von Armand's Crowd Insights Monitor project comes in. There's a camera that's looking down at us right now. This is camera number two, which is called the Terrace. And as a camera owner, I can show you what it looks like here. And in the summer, it's full of tables of picnic goers enjoying beers and beverages by the waterside. Currently, about six cameras are installed on the Marine Terrain. This way, Tom, in cooperation with the municipality of Amsterdam, measures the occupancy level of the site in order to avoid dangerous situations and intervene where necessary. We're measuring the number of people 
the, the density, uh, we're measuring speed of the crowds and the directions that they're moving. And also, we're testing right now uh, safe distances, 1.5 meters uh, between the objects, uh, which, of course, classified as people. If you are thinking of surveillance, Markus Funstein can reassure you. He works together with Tom. Markus is responsible for the computer algorithm. This anonymizes visitors before the images are analyzed. So first of all, it's an open source solution. So once it's online, then everyone can verify that we don't do any crazy things with it. Um, second of all, um, here we just take the image, feed it into the algorithm, and a number comes out. And actually the number is the only thing that gets sent anywhere. The, the image does not touch any other computer than the ISO security certified server that we have. And even there, it is only stored for the brief second, millisecond that is needed in order to make the prediction. Predictions for a possible overcrowding, that is. By the way, although the Crowd Insights Monitor was planned and developed before the outbreak of the corona pandemic, it helped to regulate campus activity during the pandemic. For that, Tom's company TAP also worked with social distancing droids that drew circles. Once the weather turned nice, people came here to, uh, to cool off and to meet each other. But the data that we were collecting said, whoa, this isn't safe. So then we got the robots to draw circles everywhere. And then people organized themselves and colonized a little circle. And then we could see the, the before and after. So the data showed us before the circles was about 350 uh, people here in the picnic area, which is a little bit unsafe. Uh, after the circles, it dropped down to about 250, and that became the safe capacity to let people yeah. in, the, in the summer. The Crowd Insights Monitor is still in its test phase. Once it's up and online, the algorithm could combine the statistics with weather or travel data to be able to predict the level of crowdedness. Citizens can already get information online or read on these smart screens about what data is being gathered and, of course, how crowded the Marineterrain is. So the data that we're collecting now it can inform the public about what kinds of things should we be sharing, what kinds of things should we be collecting, what's okay, what's not okay. And so that's, that's, that's a real uh, big part of the research that we're doing. We develop it for the citizens and the citizens can look at it and they can give feedback on how it works or improve it. Also other cities can do the same thing and by doing that we improve our system as well. Markus and Tom say that when working with citizen data, the least companies should do is guarantee transparency. It's really about getting permission for technology companies and technologists to, to bring their tools into uh, the city to, to start solving problems. Because otherwise, people look at them uh, with a lot of suspicion. You know, people, I think, are increasingly suspicious of technology companies in general, uh, and by extension now, smart city technology companies as well. Anthony Townsend views the role of the private sector as very important. Its tech innovations and engineering capabilities should be utilized, but like Tom and Markus, he's also convinced that this needs to happen with the public being involved. One question remains. Is our data safe? The risk is real. So you want to have trust. Like every server on the internet is prone to be hacked. I expect every single day to wake up and see news that the Chernobyl of smart cities has happened somewhere in the world. We are primed for that to happen. It is inevitable and it's imminent.